The following political program sponsored by Citizens for Reagan Committee. Place your left hand upon the Bible and raise your right hand. <clears throat> Do you solemnly swear that you will support and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California against all enemies, foreign or domestic? I do. That you will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. I do. That you take this obligation... This was the night Ronald Reagan became governor of California. January 2nd, 1967. Governor Reagan was born and raised in Illinois. I do. Governor Reagan, I now declare you to be duly installed as governor of the state of California. And as another Illinois Republican said some time back, government should be of the people, by the people, for the people. That kind of government, of the people, by the people, for the people, arrived that night in California. I am here with those I love the most in all the world, and with friends who have come to share this moment. And I am fully cognizant of the importance of this and what it means to so many people. Someone back in our history, I wasn't too good a student, but I think it was Benjamin Franklin said, if ever someone could take public office and bring to public office the teachings and the precepts of the Prince of Peace, he would revolutionize the world and men would be remembering him for a thousand years. I don't think anyone could ever take office and be so presumptuous to believe he could do that or that he could follow those precepts completely. I can tell you this. I'll try very hard. I think it is needed in today's world. How did Governor Reagan get to be governor? How did he do it? The hard way by beating the unbeatable Pat Brown. Pat Brown, like Lyndon Johnson, was an organizer of power, the willing tool of those who believed in tax and tax, spend and spend, elect and elect. And electing was something Pat Brown was an expert in. In 1958, Pat Brown ran for governor against the most powerful Republican in California the minority leader of the United States Senate, William Nolan. And Brown won by one million votes. I have sent my congratulations to Attorney General Edmund Brown. He has been given the opportunity and the responsibility to be Chief Executive of California for the next four years. In 1962, Brown ran against another Republican of national stature, the former Vice President of the United States, Richard Nixon and Brown defeated him by almost a quarter of a million votes. I congratulate Governor Brown, as uh, Herb Klein has already indicated, for his victory. But the Republican Party, under new leadership in California, needs a, uh, a, a new birth of spirit, a new birth of unity, uh, because... Uh, Bill Nolan, Dick Nixon, what Republican was left? The more they thought about it, the more Republicans remembered Ronald Reagan. And they remembered that speech he made during the 1964 presidential election. Somewhere a perversion has taken place. Our natural unalienable rights are now considered to be a dispensation of government. And freedom has never been so fragile, so close to slipping from our grasp as it is at this moment. Winston Churchill said the destiny of man is not measured by material computations. When great forces are on the move in the world, we learn we're spirits, not animals. 
And he said there's something going on in time and space and beyond time and space, which, whether we like it or not, spells duty. You and I have a rendezvous with destiny. We'll preserve for our children this, the last best hope of man on Earth, or we'll sentence them to take the last step into a thousand years of darkness. We will keep in mind... And but was there more to Ronald Reagan than one campaign speech? Yes, a lot more. 1964 wasn't the start of Ronald Reagan's interest in public affairs and public issues. Public affairs are something Ronald Reagan has been active in for over 20 years. In 1945, Ronald Reagan shed his army officer's uniform and returned to Hollywood. He became extremely active in labor union affairs. Ronald Reagan was elected six times to be president of the Screen Actors Guild, the AFL-CIO union of some 15,000 actors and actresses who work in motion pictures. He led his union in contract negotiations, in strikes against the Hollywood studios. Ronald Reagan is the only labor union president ever to be elected governor of any state in the country. In 1947, Ronald Reagan traveled to Washington to testify at House Un-American Activities Committee hearings. I will be frank with you that as a citizen, I would hesitate or I would not like to see any political party outlawed on the basis of its political ideology because we've spent 170 years in this country on the basis that democracy is strong enough to stand up and fight for itself against the inroads of any ideology, no matter how much we may disagree with it. However, if it is proven that this organization... Then, in 1954, Ronald Reagan became host of the General Electric Theater, and his cross-country speaking engagements with the people of America began. We were aware, of course, that uh, Ron Reagan was a strong union man, and that he was a strong Democrat. Uh, we never noticed, though, that he was speaking from a political or labor partisan viewpoint. I recall at one time he said that uh, he thought the party, the Democratic Party that he'd been associated with, had left him. And uh, then I think in the early 60s, 60s, he registered as a Republican. And now our national debt is one and a half... For over 20 years, he had been speaking out on public issues, but never as a political candidate. Perhaps his time had come. For several years and through the 1964 election, the Republican Party in California was badly divided. What the party needed, desperately needed, was a man who could unite the party behind him. Someone who could end party feuds and heal party wounds someone who could carry the Republican Party to victory at the polls. That someone turned out to be Ronald Reagan. But Ronald Reagan was not an easy man to convince. In 1948, the Democrats had asked him to run for Congress. He refused. In 1962, Republicans approached him about running either for the Senate or the State House. He refused. But this time, too many Californians wanted him. He couldn't refuse. I've come to a decision that even a short time ago I would have thought impossible for me to make. And yet I make it with no lingering doubts or hesitation. As of now, I am a candidate seeking the Republican nomination for governor. In the months ahead, I will present... Did the people respond? They loved it. The next governor of the state of California, Ronnie Reagan. He gave the voters the facts. The administration of California's welfare is in such a snarl of red tape that it's becoming difficult for this program to fulfill its purpose. Each new applicant for welfare must be greeted by the filling out of 15 separate forms. This is followed then by a constant reevaluation and the submission of these reports. 
to where counties have protested that they must average sending to Sacramento from each county office of welfare 180 reports a month. Other forms must be filled out every time the recipient has a special need, and this can range from a doctor's bill to a bus ride. And the county welfare officials have charged that for special claims totaling as little as $1 to the welfare recipient, the paperwork to process that claim comes to $10 in the administrative budget. He might even try to explain why in this last five years, an 18% increase in our population has been met with a 49% increase in the number of people on welfare and a 100% increase in the cost of welfare. Perhaps the time has come for institutions of higher learning to assert themselves as positive forces in the battle for men's minds. And this could mean they might insist upon mature, responsible conduct and respect for the individual from their faculty members, and they might even call on them to be proponents of those ethical and moral standards demanded by the great majority in our society. He gave the voters the facts. The voters gave him their votes. In California, where Democrats outnumber Republicans three to two, Ronald Reagan won by one million votes. Let's remember also that we didn't achieve any narrow partisan victory this time, but we had many good friends from the other party and the independents. But almost immediately, the new governor met his first crisis, education. Governor Reagan had made a reasonable statement about tuition. In higher education, we have been and are providing a premium service, an education superior to most and equal to the best. Now, prorating the university budget, we're spending nearly $3,000 a year to educate each student at the university level and about half that much for those enrolled in the state college system. So far, those receiving this education have not been required to share in the cost, which makes us unique among the states. We suggested that if these economies threatened either quality or numbers, we might assess a reasonable tuition, a little more than 10% of the cost. At the same time, students for whom this would be a hardship would have access to scholarships and loans payable after graduation. When I say we suggested tuition, I mean just that. The governor cannot impose tuition. Only the regions can make this decision for the university and the legislature for the colleges. But I say to you, if the colleges and the universities can cut their budgets and maintain quality without tuition, this certainly will meet with my approval. But I have no intention of asking the agitators California took to this dig reasonable statement as a declaration of war. Ladies and gentlemen, the governor has come to see us. We owe him a courtesy. I urge you to treat this man courteously. Let us show the respect for the office. I do not believe it constitutes political interference for the people of the state to submit to the university or the academic community telling the people of the state how much money they must put up for the support of that school and the people submissively giving in without having any voice with regard to the amount. But California's governor had more important work to do. He had inherited a state with too much debt, too much crime, too big a bureaucracy. As the governor had said, what is needed is not more government, but better government. His first move, replace the political hacks. Turn government back to the people. Get talented young citizens to work for the people. But I found I'd inherited a government that was spending more than a million dollars a day over and above the state revenues. The governor had been spending like he was practicing to be president. <laughs> we put a freeze on the ordering of new cars and the anguish screams would have curdled your blood. And yet, funny enough, in a few months, we were told that for the first time in the history of man's memory, there was a surplus of automobiles available in the state motor pools. I discovered there was a streak of tourists in all of our state employees. They were all over the place. 
so we put a freeze on out-of-state travel. We didn't tell them they couldn't go. We just said they had to come in and tell us where they were going and why. And that reduced the budget for out-of-state travel 78%. <laughs> For eight years, the number of state employees have been increasing at a rate of four to five and a half percent each year. Now, we didn't think it was necessary, but we had to prove it. So we put a freeze on hiring replacements for those who quit or retired or left the service. And now, a year later, I can tell you that we did bring that annual increase to a halt and did a little better. There are tonight two and a half percent fewer employees in the state of California than there were one year ago. Not all of our savings were in the area of millions of dollars. In my office, I discovered a stack of stationery with another fellow's name on it. Now, custom decrees it should be burned, but I didn't want to add to the smog in California. <laughs> I've got some with my name on it for formal correspondence, but I figured there must be some in the family stuff that we could make use of this. So now the girls just X out that other name and type mine in. And you know I get a certain amount of pleasure out of that. <laughs> but we turned, and this was the most inspiring and exciting thing, we turned to the people, as we said we would. We turned first to a Blue Ribbon Citizens Committee from all over our state, not to screen the applicants for jobs, but to go out and recruit employees, to go to major business concerns and twist the arms of employers until they would give us, at least for a limited period of time, bright young executives to take the appointed positions in government. But then we gathered in one room several hundred of the leading people in our state, the most successful business and professional people, and we told this group we wanted blood, their blood. We wanted them to give up their businesses and their occupations for from four to six months on a voluntary basis. They were chosen on the basis of their expertise and their particular skills and knowledge. They were formed into task forces under the guidance of a business management firm, and they raised the money to hire the business management firm. And 274 of our most successful citizens have just completed six months full time going into every agency and department of our state government and coming back with 1,800 specific recommendations as to how modern business practices can be put to work to make government more economical and more efficient. I believe that all over this great nation of ours, there are citizens who believe that government is their business and they're waiting to be asked. They'll serve if someone will give them a chance. If someone in government, for a change, will have a faith in the people's ability to run their own affairs. Governor Reagan's accomplishments in California were the kinds of things people all over the country ask him to come talk about. And then, the inevitable happened. Wherever he went, all over the country, people ask him where he stood on the national issues. This is where he stands. Not too many days ago, our country was on fire because an assassin's bullet took one man's life. Whatever you may think of Martin Luther King, whether you approved or disapproved, I think something of America was killed also. And I think the murder of that man and the death of America began with the first acceptance of compromise with the law, tolerance of those who would apply the law unequally because of race or religion, and acceptance of those who advocate breaking those laws with which they are in disagreement. And it includes those in government, unless and until they have the courage to say that the law will be enforced equally to all and at all times with no exceptions. I've learned how our economy is not extended, its bounty to all of our citizens. I've listened to their hopes and their hopelessness, and I've heard their plea. And curiously enough, it's not for more welfare. It's for jobs. And it's for good schooling and discipline in the schools their children attend, not busing across town to some other school. And I have to ask myself why. 
why in all these recent years have we as Republicans let this whole humanitarian field be preempted by the opposition when their record in the entire field of welfare, in their entire field of human relations, is one of colossal and almost complete failure. Their whole big government approach has institutionalized poverty, perpetuating its degradation until welfare becomes a way of life under the second and third generation of the recipient families. They have tried this raising of people by mass movements. Well, our philosophy is based on a belief in the individual, in his freedom and in his rights. And in this area of human relations, we're dealing with individuals. Each one of these people, unique. Each one crying out in his soul for his rightful heritage of dignity and the right to shape his own destiny. But we have a chance to prove as Republicans, to prove that we're more than just negative critics. We have a chance to prove that ours, ours is the wave of the future. Let's tell them that we will employ whatever measures are necessary to start saving human beings, but we're going to stop destroying them. The President's Commission has accused our people of a sickness. Well, many of us are sick, but not with hatred and the bigotry that they talk about. I think we're sick. We're sick of a so-called leadership at home that has left the ship of state adrift without rudder or compass. One who abandoned, who abdicated the leadership will now treat with an enemy. And those of his party who would replace him offer only that they would not have waited even this long to give the enemy across a table the victory that he couldn't win on the field of battle. And what are the young men who are bleeding their lives into the rice paddies and the jungle trails of that faraway land? If their sacrifice was in vain, if it was not in our national interest for them to be there in the first place, who put them there and why? And if it is in our national interest for them to be there, why is it suddenly no longer so? And why, why have they been denied the victory they are so capable of winning? You and I owe those young men a question. We should keep asking this question. Ask if the enemy truly desires peace, then let him prove it by agreeing to a mutual ceasefire so that when the talking starts, the dying stops. <laughs> Robert McNamara, the Secretary of Defense, has ended his woe-begone demonstration of military ineptitude. Others are falling away now as the palace guard struggles for power. His play had a seven-year run, beginning with the Bay of Pigs and closing with the humiliating theft of one of our ships and the kidnapping of 83 young Americans. In the last, as in the first, there was a foundering of purpose and a loss of nerve. And as has become fashionable of late, clever men who preside over our military force and strategy congratulate themselves on sidestepping another decision and avoiding action. The official explanation given for the inability for our air forces in the Far East to move out in support of the Pueblo is that all the fighters on alert in Korea are equipped only for nuclear retaliation. But hasn't that been the most persistent claim of this administration? Hasn't their claim been that we have moved at a cost of $500 billion over these last few years from a nuclear footing to one that would avoid the threat of the bomb and give us a flexible response? And now when the response is needed, we've had no response at all. Our ship has been stolen, our young men kidnapped, and our government assures us it is upset. Strong letter follows. A government's only excuse for being is to guarantee the collective strength of all of us in defense of even one among us, whenever then, wherever the rights of that one are threatened. We're despised abroad and divided at home. Our creditors hold a claim to our gold and our coins are no longer silver. In truth, we no longer control the very currency of this nation. And we're faced with a fiscal crisis of a greater proportion than anything known since the dark Friday of October 1929. Those in power lack the courage to take the steps called for lest they prove politically unpopular. 
The people of this nation want a leadership that's willing to face its moment of truth, to remind our people of their heritage and their greatness, to give them back their courage. And our responsibility is to preserve the values that made this nation great. That American dream that we should reinstitute is not that every man will be level with every other man, but that every man will have the freedom to be whatever God intended him to be. That government exists to preserve the rights of even the least individual among us when those rights are unjustly denied and wherever in the world that individual may be. That government's function is to protect society from the lawbreaker and not the other way around. I think this country wants a leadership, wants a government in its nation's capital that will offer the hand of friendship to every other nation, but not out of fear. Peace is our purpose, but we want a nation that will say we shall always at whatever cost preserve the strength to keep that peace. And we'll have the courage to tell the people the truth with a faith in their courage and their willingness to support us in the hard decisions that must be made. And I think above all, the people of this country want a nation that once again will stop trying to buy the world's affection and start earning its respect. <laughs> Let us as Republicans have the courage to lift such a banner. One that asks the best of all of us instead of promising what seems to be the best for only some of us. We can lift that kind of a banner in this election year. And not a banner that's made up of the pale pastels of political expediency. Not the idle promises that have been made that we've seen in the past made by our opposition. Appealing to every voter bloc regardless of how much it divides the country. Turning American against American. Let us instead appeal to another kind of voting bloc. A voting bloc that crosses all the racial and religious and ethnic and political lines in this country. A voting bloc that's made up of the men and women of America who go to work, support their communities, support their churches and their charities, send their kids to school, and who ask only that they be allowed to live their own lives, to make their own decisions with regard to their own destiny. The time has come for Americans once again to prove their greatness. I think the Republicans have an opportunity as well as a challenge to be more than just a political party. This now is a time for a crusade. This is a time for someone to offer this leadership. Ronald Reagan, governor of the most powerful state in the Union. Where does he go from here? people in our land want something better, and I believe they will follow our party if we have the courage to stand for principle. Is there anyone among us, do we know anyone, who doesn't nurture down in a corner of his heart a desire and a belief that government can be something deserving of our respect and worthy of our pride, that we can have government of and by as well as for the people, government reflecting our faith in God as the author of our freedom. I want that for our children. I'm sure that you want it for yours. Where does Governor Reagan go from here? In a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, that is up to you to decide. Preceding political programs sponsored by Citizens for Reagan Committee. <laughs>